Won't you? Won't you? Forgive the longer than normal opening clip. I'll be your Katarina Bride, you filthy ingrates. But sometimes a little you snow can... piercer gnosticism. Is therapeutic. Would have frozen solid 18 years ago today. You people who have suckled the generous titty of Wilford ever since for food, shelter, and now in front of our hallowed water supply section, no less, you repay his kindness with violent hooliganism. Today, philosophy with the very excellent James Ellis from Hermetics. Precisely 74% of you shall die. Not the zero I talk of a lot, but level zero for like, for, you know, what the, what the people online call normies. Because I don't think most people are operating on the, the level of level one. I'm not saying I'm above them. There's nothing wrong with just living your life and getting on with it, but. But in terms of like every, I think, you know, like everyday conversation where people are saying things like, how are you? You know, how was your weekend? Those dead statements that that needs to be like level zero. Where there's just, there's just no content. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras. And today we welcome James Ellis. Isn't that, was it okay to out you, yeah, James? Because yeah. yeah. and You've been flying under the radar for a while. <laughs> yeah, so I went. For, I went. And I've been under the name Meta Nomad for like since 2017. I've been blogging and writing under that name, uh, just because I believe you know. I remember the just about remember the old days of the internet where forums were full of anonymous people with like cool sounding names, and I really miss that and you know anonymity. So that was one reason, and also it's like just just so you don't get the, the two things crossed. And then I started doing things like courses where I thought, uh, I think just for like legitimization, I need to do the whole real life thing, uh, real life name. So yeah, James Ellis is fine is the, the short answer to that. Well, great. I mean, you know, like we were just chatting about just a second ago, there were so many jumping off points for folks like you and I have kind of really are open to thinking kind of in these uh, parallel and non-parallel kind of ways, you know, what is reality? What is your, what is anonymity anymore? And what is identity and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we should just jump right into this and, and let people know that we're kind of doing a swap cast here, but I'm primarily interviewing you for Skeptico and then this may go on on your excellent feed, uh, the Hermitex uh, podcast, which um, let me pull it up here for people because we were just chatting about it a minute ago. If anyone's watching on YouTube, really some great stuff here. A lot of uh, very, very insightful, deep, philosophical level three, as I like to call them, kind of conversations. What's level? What's sorry? What's level three? Okay, level three. First, what's level <laughs> one? <laughs> what's level one is like uh, science. So okay. science is, is level one, is there, is there science, you know? And like, that's one of the survey questions we're gonna go over. And what is the meaning of science? Is science obsoleted by consciousness, uh, a, 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 an understanding of consciousness that consciousness is fundamental and that maybe idealism is a better way of thinking about what we experience than is scientific materialism. So that's kind of level one. And then level two is conspiracy, really, which is if you get there and you say, wow, it's really an absurd idea to think that consciousness is an illusion, that it doesn't exist. I mean, it doesn't, it's an absurd philosophical idea. It's also an absurd scientific idea because it's been falsified. The idea that you're an epiphenomenon of the brain really doesn't hold up. So that's level two is kind of the controversy of conspiracy that comes in when we think and then level three is shit man so now that we're there you know <laughs> once we get past those two let's chat you know but if you can't if you can't come to grips with those two then to me you can't begin to have the level three conversation how does that hit you yeah that works i mean i would say though that you need to introduce a level zero 
not the zero I talk of a lot, but level zero for like, for, you know, what the, what the people online call normies. Cause I don't think most people are operating on the, the level of level one. I'm not saying I'm above them. There's nothing wrong with just living your life and getting on with it. But, but in terms of like every, I think, you know, like everyday conversation where people are saying things like, how are you, you know, how was your weekend? Those dead statements that that needs to be like level zero where there's just, there's just no content. And I try to actually veer away from them because I actually find it just an actual waste of time. <laughs> well, I, I, first of all, my orientation on this stuff, which I don't know why, but it is the nature of the show is, you know, skeptical inquiry to perpetuate doubt. I'm always thinking and it must be annoying to other people sometimes, but I'm always thinking to the counter of that, you know, which on one hand, I totally, totally agree with that. And I think you make a great point. And, and I think the way you characterize it is level zero. It, it, obviously, yeah, the normies, and that is such a <laughs> pejorative term, but we get it. We all get it immediately. But at the same time, it, there's something fundamental about uh, where we get at the end in level three that is almost circular and brings us back to level zero. Because it's like, really, what the fuck are we going to talk about? We might as well talk about football and we might as well talk about the weather because having the, to, to pr suppose that we can have some deep, deep, you know, and really uh, solve these answers to these questions uh, in any other way than just kind of intellectually, just kind of stimulating ourselves. I don't know. Maybe it is back to there's a certain basic human connection at level zero as well that I think we got to acknowledge that it's just like, hey, I'm a human being, you're a human being. What the fuck? Let's talk about the weather and whether it's going to rain today. You know what I mean? What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. But if someone started talking to me about the weather, I probably would try shy away from it i think that's a question of um of method though right so like anything that you anything can be super super interesting to talk about but it's a question of how you approach the subject uh in the way you know just saying oh bad weather we're having today yeah it is it's like those are the kind of conversations i actually really struggle to do because i don't really see the point in them at all but if someone was saying like you know if we actually began a discussion about someone came up to me and said you know do you believe the astrological movements you know, make it rain or whatever. I've never really looked into that. But if they said that, I'd be like on board straight away. So I get what you're saying that you can actually come back around and it's in terms of everyday reality, there's a certain intuition there, which makes things super interesting. But then this is like, and I know I'm already bringing, bringing him in. You said we were going to mention him, uh, but John Michael Greer, his whole sort of approachable conception of occultism where he sort of says like, once you once you sort of begin to understand the the way these things are working, the way you intuit the world, things begin to appear to you which you you are taught to say are, are rubbish, right? So it's like you know those those weird feelings you get at the time, or the idea that in a certain room you shouldn't go in there, or a certain forest there's something strange, or you know you're you're, you're in a place and you think something happened here way back in time that was really awful, or something along those lines, and you know that intuition you just you just get taught to to um suppress it because it's it's not you know already jumping into the science thing it's not scientific it's not logical um but that level three to level zero connection is you can utilize level three to begin to sort of um what i'd say what i'd say is enchant the world again there's a lot to probably break down a little bit there and i love jumping into the middle of this stuff because if we lose people, great. You shouldn't have been here anyway. <laughs> but if you stuck around this long, then maybe it is worthwhile to go back and kind of just tell people where you're coming from in general. And uh, I think this idea of uh, uh, th that you talk about so much with uh, it's accelerationism and hmm. zero accelerationism, I think uh, capitalism, I think it, it, you're going to have a, a, an idea that, you know, certainly is, I got to say, when I first heard you talking about capitalism, I'm like, what the fuck is he talking about? I mean, mm -hmm. as compared uh, versus what? Versus, you know, compared to what? There is nothing else other than free people doing what they want to kind of survive. Anything else to me mm -hmm. seems absurd, but man, we could talk for an hour on that. So go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I should have sort of done a full intro. So for those who don't know me, 
I run a, a host, Hermetics Podcast, which is a podcast of, of philosophy and um, fringe subjects, occultism, parapsychology, weird stuff. You know, I think anyone who's into that stuff sort of knows the kind of topics um, that will be on there. I mean, I target it primarily from a continental philosophy angle because that's what my education background is in. My master's is in continental philosophy. When I was in, when I was studying continental philosophy, my tutors were great, you know, um, they're great people. They taught everything that was on our curriculum. They taught well, you know, so this isn't really anything against them at all. I still speak to them. Um, and I've had, had one of them on the show, but in terms of, um, the way academia confronts philosophy in those terms, um, it's very disheartening because there's a lot going on behind the scenes, um, which is sort of ignored because we just like, it's almost like we don't have time to get into this conversation. We don't want to go there. Right. And I think there's a huge history of philosophy in general, not specifically continental, but I think more continental because those philosophers, philosophers are more open to it. Um, so one example I'll give just to sort of cut to the chase on this is that Schopenhauer, who, you know, super, super serious philosopher in the canon of Western philosophy, um, you know, the, 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 the will to life, um, we're all stuck between suffering and boredom, um, but also incorporated all this Eastern stuff. Now the Eastern stuff is accepted because it's compatible into his system, but not, not many people know that actually he, he said at one point that if any of this is worth anything, um, it's because telepathy might be existing. I might exist. So he's sort of taking these things seriously. When we say these things, let's make sure, uh, because Schopenhauer is one of those guys who kind of crosses over, right? So a lot of people mm -hmm. in the kind of consciousness interested kind of folks reference him, but then a lot of people kind of in the philosophy fields reference him as well. So what, what is he what is he getting at in terms of uh, let's, what's he getting at in terms of consciousness? Since that's a topic that I'm super interested in. In terms of consciousness, what I'd say is that for Schopenhauer, I mean, I, I view everything like, and I mean, everything view the lens of Kant, Manuel Kant. Now it's very difficult to get across Kant's philosophy in, in less than an hour, but I'll try just get off the, the, the super important bit, which is, the difference between um, the phenomenal and the noumenal or what we would understand as representation. So in terms of our senses, our perception for Kant as a human, the way in which we, the world is presented to us is a representation. So when you look at something, you're not looking at the real because it had to be processed by your brain. So it's represented to you. So Kant's point is that via our senses at no point are we dealing with reality. Now, you know, this is sort of reworded by many, many people after Kant. And there's plenty of spiritualists who have come to the same conclusion after Kant. I just generally always think, actually, I really do think Kant was the first. He was definitely the first to do this rigorously in the Critique of Pure Reason, uh, which is an extremely tough book. But if you just accept that premise, and we move to Schopenhauer, he then incorporates uh, the veil of Maya, you know, uh, which is this Eastern concept, which I believe comes from the uh, uh, Upanishads, I believe. Um, I'm not super Schopenhauerian expert, um, but the, the veil of Maya is something that, as I understand it, can be stripped back. So I think the point for Schopenhauer is he does it, he readily admits that we can never, you know, we can never actually truly attend to the real because any time that as a human, even if we're on some amazing drug trip or we think we've broken through, you know, to the other side, whatever that means, we are always in that Kantian doubt that because we are processing it, we can just never be sure it's the real. However, I think for Schopenhauer, there's definitely a possibility of communication from that other side. So he's saying that none of this really is important at all unless telepathy is like this possibility. And I think what he really means by that is unless there is a possibility of communication between the absolute real and us, you know, unless we can somehow actually begin to work out what is on this other side, this objective, then what's the point? Excellent. You, you know, one of the problems, I guess, I, I struggle with in terms of um, philosophy, the way that it's currently practiced, a lot of the people that I've listened to on your show, is the, they seem to be swamped by scientism. Mm -hmm. So what, what you just described is really just kind of 
a reworking of kind of yogic Vedic kind of philosophy reinjected, reinterpreted in this Western philosophical way, which always to me is, is interesting on one hand and it's on the other side, like go reference your sources on that, you know, a little bit because the way that it seems to be swamped is that the fundamental question seems to be the scientific question of consciousness. And that's why I always start with the absurdity of the claim that we live in today in terms of, and we'll get back to John Michael Gere, because I think it, 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 it circles back in a way, and that's that, okay, we live in a science-centered culture, a really mm -hmm. scientism-centered culture, and the idea that consciousness is an illusion, that you are an epiphenomenon of your brain, is central to that in a way that philosophers haven't processed. And then a lot of times they're just kind of following along blindly and making a lot of uh, building on that in ways that they don't even understand to go back and question, well, you know, the, the basic who am I, what, why am I here kind of nature of consciousness questions. So let's turn that into a question because we did this fun survey thing and I'm really glad that she, we had a good time doing it and looking at each other's answers there. Is conscious, what is consciousness? Is consciousness fundamental? Is consciousness an epiphenomenon of the brain? Can you expand on what you mean by epiphenomena of the brain? Just so I, mean, I know, just so I know on like I'm coming at it at the right angle. I mean, and I, oh, I'm sure you are, but, you know, just for benefit of people, because I always emphasize this point over and over. I'm really tired. I say the same shit over and over again. But, like, <laughs> if, if, <laughs> but if, if you walk into, uh, what university did you go to there? In? Uh, Staffordshire. Staffordshire. So if you go there and you go in the neuroscience department, They'll mm -hmm. tell you exactly what consciousness is and they'll pull out all their machines and they'll measure it and they'll say, here it is. It's in your brain. Mm -hmm. So consciousness is 100% a product of brain chemistry, brain electrical activity. Mm -hmm. It's in your brain, man. There ain't nothing else outside of that. And the, the thing that I don't think people fully grok is the extent, and because what people will say when you confront them with that, they go, well, there's a lot of scientists that don't, don't aren't that, you know, locked into that. It's like, no, not really. I mean, that is the dogma. That is the doctrine. If you're outside of that, then you're, you're really playing a different game because at the end of the day, that is the understanding of what consciousness is. Consciousness is something that if you want to get a little bit fancy, oh, it's an emergent property of the brain but it's still brain-based so what do you think about is that your understanding of what that um means? i would argue that that isn't an understanding at all and this is the problem of, of science and scientists for me i mean i'd just like to take a minute to just dwell on the scientism thing um and that that idea that it's this like uh, you know almost leviathan of culture it's our new god right it's the thing that we go to to make sure that everything we're doing is right um, in terms of continental philosophy, one of the reasons I actually wanted to study it is because one of its sort of cornerstones, which is why it's split from analytic, is that it has this inherent distrust of, of science and scientism as this overarching way to explain the world, right? Because what you've, what you, how you outlined the epiphenomenon, you know, consciousness is the epiphenomenon of the brain, is the same problem that I run into with science all the time, which is you know, this idea of going into the neuroscience department and they say, you know, X, Y, and Z, this is, this is consciousness or consciousness is in the brain or it's a, an emergent property. Okay. What the hell does that mean? Well, it's an emergent property or, or they'll say, you know, um, X amount of atoms does this, blah, 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 blah. It's okay. That's fine. But what the hell does it mean? Right? So what my point is with that is it's very easy for them to describe anything, um, or explain anything within this recursive language so it's like you know um why does a cancer cell do what it does okay well cancer cell is already your own terminology um it does it because of this certain mixture of chemicals which is also their same terminology and the well that the way that they'll justify that doing that is still and you're always within this circle of them explaining things and there's no originary point where you can go there's the objective truth 
it's sort of a language game for them, it seems to me. And I don't want to bring everything down to language, but what I would say is like, I'd give the example of Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, um, continental philosopher wrote Being in Time. I'll try not make this too complicated, but he takes on Descartes, you know, Rene Descartes, his cogito, um, you know, one of the most, probably the most famous saying in philosophy, arguably, you know, I think therefore I am. Now, this is taught in high schools as this like, this, this saying which you just say it and it's like, I think therefore I am, right? This is sort of the same thing we're talking about with consciousness. So you say, I think therefore I am and everyone goes, oh wow, yeah, like, these, like, like that means anything. Heidegger sort of steps back and he says, well hang on, what the hell is am? What the hell is being? right? It's just meaningless. I think therefore I am. Okay, well, you've, you've outlined, you know, massive, massive things there which you haven't taken on. What the hell is I? What is it to think? And what is am? What is it to be? And you haven't actually addressed any of them. And Heidegger then goes back and addresses, addresses being. And I think he does, does a good job. He begins, so I would actually, I would completely disagree with the scientist argument. What I'd say is I'd go back to Kant again in that the only, the only thing we can assess reality from is what we are given, what works, which is this representation. We may very well be stuck in something which isn't real, but you, have, you can't just then go, you can't do the scientist thing and just say, this is consciousness, like we have it. I don't they really think, you know, that, I just think that's a bit of a lie. You have to begin from, I don't think Kant's proposition has been, you can't disprove the proposition. It's like, how can you prove that this is reality if we have to process it first? Yeah. You have to begin from that. I, I, so I fundamentally agree with you, right? Yeah. So, but the, the part that I think, you know, is, is tricky there mm -hmm. is that in a way, Kant is introducing the miracle that we're trying to avoid in the first place. So it, it's almost like, you know, we are fundamentally this experience, that's all we know, right? And even when we get into the, that's why I think the, the AI stuff and the you know, simulation hypothesis stuff is so interesting. And my go-to guy on that is uh, Eckhart Tolle, you know, the <laughs> modern kind of spiritual teacher, where he goes, okay, and someone pushed him on the uh, simulation theory. And he goes, okay, mm. so let's say we are living in a simulation. You're still there. You're still the one experiencing that. So your experience is all you can know without invoking miracles. So to a certain extent, the, the problem I have with Kant is it's in a way, to me, it's backdoor materialism because it's saying, okay, you do have this brain, you do have these senses, you are interpreting the outside world as it comes in. So, aha, therefore you're one step away from your experience. It's like, well, I, you're assuming now all this kind of stuff that we want to strip away and say we don't want to assume so if we start with just we are we are here we are aware we are conscious it seems to me that that has to be the starting point not that we are interpreting being here do you get what i mean yeah no 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 i get what, i get what you mean um but i would say that you can't ignore that proposition of the fact that your reality is because we, we do we our understanding is that we do sense it you know the way that we we apprehend as Kant would say the world vision sight hearing touch these things are things which have to be processed so this is an argument that you can't deny now with the idea with the materialism that's a super super interesting idea because Kant has been sort of reformulated by some people to be this sort of radical materialist in the sense that we exist within a materialism of our own sort of self and we're just sort of stuck in this this prison of materialism um and the way out of that is to do with time in the sense that linear chronic time it just isn't real but it still has to be in time everything is in time so we have this linear time which is false but it's still in time which implies that in some way pure time is getting to us now that sounds very, very complicated. But well, it's I think not just complicated, <laughs> but it's kind of self-contradictory, right? I mean, it's like... Yeah, having like two times is, it's really difficult to think about. Yeah. So what do you, what do you make of, you know, the go-to where we always wind up on this show a lot of times mm -hmm. in turn with people who are kind of of this science bent, because, you know, the first book that I wrote, Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything, 
was really about consciousness and mm -hmm. centering around the experiments that have been done. Like, what do you make of the quantum physics, you know, early 1900s, double slit experiment, Schrodinger's cat. That's usually our go-to in huh. terms of pointing to a way that, that kind of, in a more direct way, gets at falsifying the kind of stuff you're talking about. These are, these are super, super interesting experiments, but the people who are doing them aren't using them correctly. And what I mean by that is, I'm, I'm just gonna stay on the Kant line because we're there and it's easy to use. The way in which we do interpret the world, that's, we are, we are then a subject, right? So we have a subjectivity. The world is a subjective relation to us. The interesting thing about these experiments, these, these quantum experiments, the double slit experiment, and, and one recently, which Eric Wargo mentioned, and he didn't seem to, what, seem to see what I was trying to get at. He mentioned a quantum computer, which supposedly produces an effect which affects its cause. So it's retrocausal. So it's affecting, it's affecting something that's beginning, right? And I said to him, I posed this question is, what is the subjectivity of that computer and in what sense, you know, if we were to go into the mind of that computer, in what way is it actually being presented reality? Because it's clear to us that it isn't beholden to linear time because it can play around with time. And he sort of said, oh, I don't, he, 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 he is assessing it in a completely different way, which is completely fine. So I was then thinking, well, hang on, we've got this computer, which is now sort of completely out of joint in time because it can play around with what we understand as the future and the past. And that then I think is the easier way to begin to think about time and consciousness is that our consciousness, the way that, that we, we, we experience reality, if that is how one could define being conscious, is completely trapped within the progressive forward mode of time. Uh, if we were to do anything else, it just wouldn't make any sense. Our consciousness is completely uh, like just clutching to that idea of the future and the past and the present. And so then I think, any serious question of consciousness needs to begin to, especially when you see things about like this quantum computer is, well, what is, you know, it, what, a very simple question would be is, why is it that our consciousness processes time the way we do? Um, and the, the answer to that is very difficult and it's very bleak because I first, you know, um, the, the, the philosopher that I'm about to release a book on in probably less than a week, less than two weeks, Nick Land, calls it the human security system. You know, it's a system of security for us because it gives us, you know, as, as almost a, a resource for something larger than us, it gives us this progression. Um, but the past and the present and the future only make sense in linear time, which isn't real. So they just do not exist in that way. That's not how time works. Um, and as soon as, you know, now we are beginning to play around with things, you know, Eric, you know, Wago is great because you've got these things like precognitive dreams, which are basically this documented proof that time doesn't work how we think it is. And this quantum computer who's playing around with, you know, the past and the future and putting them, you know, mixing them up. It's like, well, okay, we, we just need to, and the quantum, the, the double slit experiment, we just need to accept time does not work how we think it works. And all it is, is if we were to say that humans are, you know, let's call linear time just linear, and humans are humans. Humans interpret time linearly. That is it. Other things might not. We can't prove it any any other way because we're stuck in linear linear time. Man, again, one. I don't know if anyone's going to be able to follow this conversation. <laughs> or number two, if there, uh, how many people are interested in it? I I've had this. I've, I've spoken about this stuff so much. The time stuff, and like I will admit. I, every time I try to think, like, how can I make this simpler? How can I make this simpler? And it, no, it, no, it, it's right there. Thinking so, about it's something your brain really, really struggles with, and I think that's actually built in to linear time. Is that totally? As soon as you start thinking, like, you know, the future isn't a thing, but because we're stuck in it, you just cannot comprehend it. Totally. But there, there are so many uh, tricky points to that. So, are, are you familiar with the work of Dean Radin and his presentiment experiments? I've heard of Dean, Dean Radin, but I haven't, I haven't read anything of his, unfortunately. Yeah, you'd be really interested because, so he's a parapsychologist, right? Mm -hmm. So with these guys, these guys were on this thing kind of from the beginning, just kind of taking it from another angle. And uh, Radin came up with a great experiment and he's super smart guy, you know, PhD, Bell Labs, uh, 
University of Illinois, all this kind of stuff. But now at the Ions Institute. So he said, look, I'm going to take an old tried and true freshman psychology experiment, sit you down in front of a computer screen, and then show you images, some of them really horrific, some of them, you know, bunnies in a prairie kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I am going to measure, and this is the pre-sentiment versus precognition, I'm going to measure your physiological response to those. Mm -hmm. So these have been done like for a long, long time, you know, these mm -hmm. college mm -hmm. freshmen. He said, let's look at that data more carefully. And what he found was a response before the image is presented. Actually, before the image is even selected by the computer. So, mm -hmm. boom. So now we're instantly, you know, precognition, presentiment, time is blown out of the water. Mm -hmm. the, the experiment is replicated over and over again in his lab. At this point, it's been, it's been one of the most replicated experiments going because he's really driven that home. Seven labs across the world over 50 times, six sigma kind of result, you know, from science, statistics. It's over the top in terms of repeatable. And it does totally blow away this idea of a linear time, as you're talking about. The, 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 the interesting thing about that to me, there's, there's a couple of points. One, you know, we're still limited, like in the languages you said, you said our consciousness, right? So even that is a question. Is it our consciousness? Are we in consciousness or are we separate from consciousness? And some philosophers, you know, and Bernardo Castrop, Dr. Bernardo Castrop is one of our go-to guys here. I think he makes a strong case that idealism is a better way of understanding this and that we are in consciousness in some way we can't fully understand. And the other thing I think that, that supports that from a data standpoint is we have all these extended consciousness experiences that we have to deal with, near-death experience science, Hold on, this cat is insisting to go out. <laughs> hey there, here. Um, Near-death experience science, uh, you know, you're men mentioning uh, hallucinogenic kind of experiences, all those things. ET experiences, They one characteristic they all have is they seem to bounce us outside of space and time, right? So what you'll hear from a near-death experience person is, I was there for a week, I came back, I had been clinically dead for seven minutes, you mm -hmm. know, so there's this kind of. I've had one of these experiences. I've not had a near death experience, but I had one of those sort of weird temporal experiences when I was younger. Someone we used to play this game when we were kids. It's probably a very British thing. I don't know if they do it anymore when you can get your elbow around someone's neck. And if you, if you get the, the two, I don't know what it is, they'll pass out. And we used to do that when we were drunk, which is a bad idea. Don't condone it. Uh, <laughs> but you do silly things with your kids. Anyway, I, you know, I vividly remember this. I got knocked out and I, my memory then was to walk from my house to my friend's house where I was, which was a 30 minute walk. And that's all I did when I was knocked out was do this walk. And then when I got to the kitchen in the house, I laid down in the position and woke up, but I was 100% but then when I woke up, I was like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I was apologizing because I, I thought they'd be worried because I was passed out for like 30 minutes. And they were like, what do you mean? What do you mean? And I said, oh, I've been gone ages. And they said, no, no, you like, you know, five seconds. And that was my right. first time where I said, okay, time does not work. <laughs> time does not work how you think it works. And as you said, we don't really know what to do with that. And no, I, guess... I mean, that's the question. Where was I? What, what is it? And I mean, I think this is what a lot of people who, uh, when I had... Um, Oh, it's really bad. I forgot his name. We were talking about DMT and he's sort of saying that this is, I think this is on a practical level. One of the best things to do is find a way to prolong and like stabilize mm -hmm. the, the time in these areas because they're normally so fleeting and chaotic. You can only just sort of grasp onto them and then you're, you're drawn back. So if you can sort of prolong it. Um, but I think there's another question there as to the, why is it that our brain or consciousness disallows us to retain what it was we learned in that that other time right so most people who've done acid say like they really can't remember anything of it but something is retained because they learned something from it so there's a question of memory and retention is that you know in terms of 
senses you just can't remember anything it's like a protection but then other people you know report their ocd is suddenly gone and they don't want to smoke cigarettes anymore so there is something has been retained so i think there's something interesting there happening are, are you familiar with the near-death experience science the work that's been done there um no i'm not no you, you know there's some of it that again just kind of swapping stories now that I think you'd find interesting along these lines that we're talking about. And the one uh, particularly jumps to mind, I use it all the time, but it's from a, a British um, researcher, PhD in nursing. Uh, her name is Dr. Penny Sartori. And she worked in the critical care unit of a hospital for a long time. and came up with a rather novel experiment that's been replicated since, where she went to people in the cardiac arrest ward who had experienced cardiac arrest and had clinically died. And the important thing there is from this, back to this hard problem of consciousness, you know, consciousness is an emergent property of the brain. Physiologically, after cardiac arrest, we have a, as good a handle as we're gonna get on what goes on. You know, we've studied that for a long time in humans and animals, and we think we understand what's going on. So it could change, but we think we understand. And we don't think it's, it, your brain is in a state that can create memories or create these kind of radically, uh, radically conscious experiences that people report. So she goes to him and she says, okay, you just died. Tell me what your, end, tell me what your resuscitation was like. So she's got a group of patients, right? So she has 60 mm -hmm. patients. 30 of them have had an NDE, 30 of them didn't have an NDE. She goes to all of them. She goes, tell me what your resuscitation is like. The ones that didn't have an NDE, they're like, lady, what are you talking about? I, I was dead, right? Nothing, black, nada, I don't know anything. She goes, tell me, tell me what you think. Just tell me what you think. They go, okay, well, I think this and this and that, like out of the TV show. Mm -hmm. She goes to the 30 that had a near-death experience. And they are able to recount it exactly. They go, it was crazy. I was immediately, I was shot up and I was on the outside corner of the room, or I was right next to the doctor, or I was two feet under, but then I moved above my body. And I saw them wheel in this cart and they put the paddles on me, but the paddles weren't working. And then they were frantic and this, they're going into exact detail of what happened to them during resuscitation. This so we can deal with the time part, which also comes into it because then they have all these extraordinary experiences. And like you, they come back and go, you know, it was five minutes. It wasn't, you know, what you think it was like two days or whatever. But it also kind of challenges us in terms of uh, even the question of what we are processing in that extended realm and what we can bring back. Because here's a point where people are bringing back very vivid memories, but then they're also at times kind of echoing exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Then they go, because invariably, not invariably, but sometimes then people transcend to this other, you know, super extended reality and they'll say things like, every question before I could even verbalize it in my head or even think about it was answered. And I felt like I knew everything. And now I can't tell you. I just tell you mm -hmm. that I have this internal knowing, like you said, and my life is like this. And their life isn't always better also. They have integration problems, much higher rate of a divorce, much higher rate of uh, physical problems a lot of times. So there's the people who have really studied the near-death experience and the after effects of it. It, it, it does provide an interesting lens, but it's not easily kind of chopped and parsed. And that, what do you think of that? And then, and then, then we'll talk more about that. Um, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, I, I'm always going to assess consciousness from, from what we can use because otherwise and I don't think that's a scientific thing. I think that's a practical, practical thing. So, I mean, this is like going back to Heidegger, I think just to, to give one example of the way I would begin to assess it is saying things such as like between physiology and consciousness, I think these are sort of unhelpful because there are already these conceptions that are 
made up bias to explain something else external to us. So it's like we can sort of buy into our own bias. And I think Heidegger is the one, one of the few philosophers who really, really, really strives to make sure that he is not falling back upon his own biases. You know, and beginning from the absolute base of being, he then defines man as Dasein, which is just, uh, there is, or, or basically uh, sort of, <laughs> it's bad, I just can't remember it. I spoke about it just the other day. But the, the primary point to remember of Dasein is that Heidegger begins by saying, okay, well, one thing that is primary to us, which is super, super important about, you could say being, or you could say consciousness, is we are beings which investigate our own being. That is sort of his starting point is we do know this because we are already, what we're doing when we're doing this is assessing it. So what does that you know, tell us about things? And I think to begin from there, and I think my problem with it, and the reason I probably haven't read a lot of the consciousness literature is that I think it just does seem to me that so many people have had these experiences where they've, they've gone elsewhere or done this or this or this. They're so diff, they're so, just so different. Um, you know, the only one I've heard of is that monks who meditate, almost all of them end up believing in reincarnation. And I think it's in, to, we need to pay attention to when there is a pattern. I think that would be the important thing is uh, to try sort of... <laughs> okay, here's the big problem, I think, is I think that our, lang our scientific language is incompatible with where we go. And I've... You know, in, a, in an episode of Hans Gerding, he said, the absolute can't be known. And I would always take the pessimistic view. Some could say it's pessimistic or, you know, individuals who have this, this, these experiences, they get the knowledge, they get it. They made the, they, they did the bridge. They, it's, a, it's a subjective intuition to them. I don't think there's a way where that communication is going to be universally bridged for us. Um, I don't, you know, I just don't think that's that's a thing. Um, and I know that's sort of a cop-out answer and a bit depressing, but that's where I sort of stand on it is that it's, you know, it's, that's not going to happen. I don't think we're ever going to be able to um, sort of logically explain what's going on over there because we don't have that, we don't have that com compatibility innate in our minds to be able to do that. See, th therein lies the, the, the problem with, I think, philosophy to a certain <laughs> extent. No, okay. it, really. I mean, I, I know I'm maybe poking the bear there a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's like, ultimately, we do have a need for some grounding. We, we, most of us have a need for some grounding in something that is like science, some kind of organized, systematic, empirical way of measuring and figuring out what those measurements mean. Mm -hmm. You know, so... I think we like the idea that we can collect a thousand or two thousand, like Dr. Jeffrey Long has, near death experiences and then catalog them and understand them and say 96% of people that come back from a near death experience no longer fear dying versus mm -hmm. in the general population. It's one of the most pronounced fears they have. Or, uh, you know, 76% of people see deceased relatives, you know. Mm -hmm. So, we want to measure almost by our nature and that draws us to science so when the philosopher comes along and says it, that there's a certain denial of that in a way that i think is is hard to is hard to take because we do want to measure even if we understand the inadequacies of it what, what do you what do you think about that james um i mean i would say that there, there, there is philosophers who have actually tackled this problem. Um, Henri Bergson is specifically is a philosopher of specifics. He always wanted to make sure that we were being very correct about, about our assessments. And this is one of the things I think Mythics, my podcast is trying to bridge is that these things are ignored and that they're, they're drawn back into this, this sort of suppressive language of philosophy where you do need to have a more holistic approach. Um, and uh, yeah, the combination between these things is where where it begins to get interesting because if you remain just in the you know like the consciousness sphere i think they get a bit caught up and it's like well you know for instance jung is you know i find jung so fascinating because that mixture between occultism and someone who's you know really understands the human psyche is a, you know far more dare i say it progressive in terms of if someone truly wants to you know heal themselves let's say if you want to if you want to heal yourself and you're just stuck within 
the language of psychology, well, then you're only you're, you're also stuck with, you know, the, the, the cures that they offer, which aren't very good because you're only remaining in sort of one sphere of existence. And what might be happening to you might be happening on a far greater level. So I think that, the, you know, that's why. Um, but in terms of sort of tackling head on why philosophy is sort of stuck, I, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> no, it, it, and it's not fair to maybe I was, but but I, I, wait, I got to poke you one more time before I let mm. you go here, and um, poke you twice actually. Okay, but with uh, John Michael Greer, fascinating guy, and mm -hmm. you guys, and I don't want to say you guys, but people like him, I so admire in so many ways, and he has taken this whole dialogue about the myth of progress and advanced it in a way that kind of brings an undeniable reality to the situation that that level zero kind of person you're talking about <laughs> just needs to, to, needs to have it jammed in their face, I guess I feel. And maybe that's what you were saying at the beginning is you just want to go and go, bullshit. I mean, you're just not looking at some of the basic real data that we have on that. And, and that's what I think to your credit and to, you know, some of the folks you have on the show. But here's the rub with that. John Michael Greer believes some stuff about global warming that isn't, isn't verifiable scientifically. And worse yet, back to my level two conspiracy thing, seems to have been tainted by um, forces that want to push that narrative in another way. So like when Al Gore 25 years ago stood on that kind of thing where he was in the movie and he raised up and he had a little pointer and he said, this is where temperatures are and this is where CO2 is going and look out. Well, you don't even have to be, you can be a, a, a level zero kind of person to go, Al, we're 25 years on. The oceans have not risen, which is the only measure we ever have to look at. I mean, where you live, they've <laughs> measured the, the, the tidal rise and the level of the ocean for hundreds of years. It's not that complicated to do. It mm. hasn't risen. They go back and they can look at the ice caps and the, the, the ice core things that they do. They can go back and look hundreds of thousands of years and they'll tell you long, steady sea levels for a long time, but then, you know, big changes also. So when, when John Michael Greer can't get that right, that is a red flag for me. He can't course correct. He can't say, gee, I was wrong about global warming, but here's how I, here's how I process that now. But the second thing I want him to say is, I was wrong about global warming because I got bullshitted. I got played by a globalist force that wants to advance certain issues that can only be solved globally. And that, whether you like that or not, whether you, it, it is a, it is definitely a political kind of thing. And the, the other side of that is not like good. You know, I'm not saying the, the fascist kind of nationalist thing is good in any way. I'm just saying, unless we understand those two forces politically and how they're corrupting the data, how they're corrupting our ability to try and understand the data, and that is conspiratorial. And unless we can approach it from a conspiratorial standpoint, we, we don't have the beginning thing to launch off and make a whole bunch of assumptions about environmentalism and about uh, the myth, even the myth of progress. We have to then step back and go, okay, what does that really mean if I'm wrong about global warming? And what does that mean about how I was duped about global warming? Mm. Any part of that well, you want to latch on to? I mean, yeah, specifically with Greer, I'm not sure he's entirely wrong about global warming because he did come at it. He comes at it sort of with the angle of truidry, which is more of a a respect for nature as opposed to the you know i really think a lot of the argument one of my big problems with the, the the climate change argument is that it's just underneath it's a very selfish argument it's like ownership of the globe like we need to stop it because it's our earth and it's like well even if you don't stop it the earth keeps going you know it, it, whether or not it's true i'm not going to get into that debate but let's just play devil's advocate and say that these things are going to happen it's all going to rise up and temperatures you know oceans rise up etc etc we're only doing that for our own benefit i don't really think it's because we care about the earth because if we cared about the earth a lot of the things that we need to do to stop climate change we would already do so i think greer's coming at it more more of a like instead of saying that the people who would say 
oh no, it's fine to cut down the rainforest, but make sure you put up some uh, some renewable sources of energy there instead of coal mines. I think Greer is more along the lines of don't cut down the forest. We don't need to. You're caught up in a consumerist game, uh, you know, which which you don't need to do at all. You know, we don't need all this modern tech. So I'd say he's coming at it um, from, from, from that direction. And I guess that's where I'm kind of jumping three levels into the conversation. I got to quit saying levels because I'm going to confuse people. Hmm. But it's like, that is the brilliance of the point that he makes. And I, I think the way you articulated it, what, articulated it was particularly good. And that's the part that I want to go jam in the face of the level zero people. And I also want to jam the science in their face and say, you think you're driving your Prius and you're saving the earth, even with inside the confines of your own ridiculous uh, uh, the scientific understanding of it, you're not. You're generating mm. more CO2 with your freaking Prius. Yeah, yeah, you the Prius, I, your love, so, I love the but, Prius argument. But, so, but the real point behind all that, I think, that isn't, isn't exposed by um, a lot of people who are in the kind of soft sciences, including philosophy, but also including a lot of the other soft sciences, is the mm. point that you made that I'm not going to get into the debate about uh, uh, climate change which is a psyop in and of itself, right? Because it's really about global warming and they've managed to kind of change the language, which we all know is a powerful way of kind of controlling. Well, this, is, this, is one thing I, this is one thing I wanted to just put in there before we go further. These are what I call, um, so in um, linguistic theory, I'm not, I don't know, I'm a master there, I might get this completely wrong. Like, so maybe a, a linguist might hear this and go, God, this guy's right off. But in linguistic theory, there's a, there's an idea, there's a thing called a free floating, signifier so a signifier is is a is a word right you signify something you say a tree and we all have an image of a tree in our head however you have these things called free floating signifiers which are basically signifiers which then they're just floating they don't they mean so much to so many so many different things to so many different people that they're basically meaningless like postmodernism is a great one or uh, even modernity is getting in there right but the Science is a class. Science is right, a class. exactly what I was going to say. Exactly what I was going to say, especially with all the Corona stuff going on. This, my point I'm trying to make with this is everything that we're talking about here is really about control and power. Because in the Corona, you know, Corona is a great example. Because in the news here in the UK, you hear things like my favorite one they say, and they say it every single news cycle without fail. I would actually put my all, all money I have on to say that every single, uh, you know daily news broadcast features it which is experts the experts the experts agree right whoa, 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 whoa. back up 10 steps which experts why are they experts why do we need these experts you know and they're, they're talking about like coronavirus spreading whatever you think about coronavirus the statement the experts have said this is absolutely meaningless same with the scientists agree or science says right it's absolutely meaningless and these are basically now like this is just power language because people just offload their personal responsibility and individual responsibility onto these words and they understand them as things which will keep them safe. The sort of, you know, the, the, the Ernest Becker argument of civilization is there just to lead us away from the fact that we're going to die. These are also just words to lead us away from the fact that we are still responsible for our own well-being and, you know, and, and no amount, you know, which is why I think people get people are actually becoming quite ill is because they're constantly caught up in the paradox of they, they, they inherited this idea that the scientists are right, but they're consistently wrong. Um, you know, same with experts. So you just sort of caught in this absolute hypocrisy, but as Deleuze and Guattari say, you know, um, God, I forgot my, like my favorite quote, uh, nothing ever died of contradictions, right? It just keeps going this sort of absurd madness just keeps going. Nothing dies of contradictions, what, but what do you end up with? This strange, oppressive mutation where you just go, scientists said it. Wait, so that means we have to do it? Yep. Well, you, you know, I think we're, we're running out of time. You have a time limit. In, uh, uh, I've got about 10 more, 10 more minutes. Okay, well, then let's move towards, then I will throw out the question. Okay. Because in a way, what we're both trying to do here and I, I, there's so many points that you just made that I could go, but w w how do we find terra firma? You know, how do we find the ground that we stand on from where we can at least approach some of these topics? Like when you threw out the fear of death thing, 
Mm. In a way, I almost feel like you brushed us, brushed that, brushed over that too quickly. Is because <laughs> it, it 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 is fundamentally maybe the only thing you know that is really at play here. And the, I agree. So we can't go to the next thing and say, and you know, this is another. You know, no, it's like that's internally that's what it's all about. That's what the from the Eastern perspective, that's how we've built all these well, stars that constitute our definition of who we are. This is, the, this is the huge problem of the modern day is that the only reason things can mean anything is when is if they're put in a finite framework, which is which is eventually going to end. What does your family mean if you know that one day you're going to die, which then makes you think, right, so I need to you know, build up something for them. And I need to teach these lessons and keep that going and build a great family. Or, you know, what does this project mean if one day I'm not going to be here or the project would end? The problem is it's a schizophrenic problem because the schizophrenic doesn't adhere to any show like this. So the schizophrenic goes beyond death because it doesn't have anything that's going to die. And this is the problem of, of the modern day is that everything that we're in, all institutions, the media, social media, Everything teaches us to live, not in the present in the Eastern sense, but in the what I call the nano present, right? Just the smallest iteration of a news cycle. You know, like what we're talking about today, this, 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 right? You've forgotten about, like, I always list things that people are probably, you know, like Brexit. We were on about Brexit for I mean, it's gone. Or Black Lives Matter before Corona, or, you know, Corona announced the election. And it's like all these things are just forgotten in an instant. And this, this really removes the position of purpose and meaning for man because you don't end up you you completely forget that you're you you exist on a finite time scale and you need to remember that i think it's important super super important to remember that but modernity hates death and suffering it sees them as bugs not features right of reality it wants to get rid of them. don't disagree with you on that i just wonder if the problem is more fundamental getting back to the kind of nature of consciousness question you know one of the spiritual questions two of the spiritual kind of little quips that i like is one you know the spiritual path is easy for one with no preferences mm -hmm. and the related one to that is um uh, you know who am i and who have i become so we are all making these assessments about what we like what we don't like who we are and mm. that has created this image of who we are so i almost feel like when we say you know modernity i get it we all understand it we all understand the oppressive force but it's really just a substitute for the experience that uh, particularly i'm drawn to kind of some of the eastern philosophies have kind of pointed out all along it's like no man it's not really modernity. You just created this shit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You've created this shit by being so attached to one, the thoughts that you've created, but two, the experiences that you've had that you misinterpreted, right? Because, you know, it's the classic, you see the stick on the ground on your walk and you think it's a snake and then you recoil because you thought there was a snake on the ground. There wasn't a fucking snake there, but you've processed it now as a snake mm -hmm. and you're going to have to unprocess that if there is some getting clean that that is desirable at some point you know so is the eastern approach does it kind of kind of jump over a lot of these perceived problems with uh modernity and uh myth of progress kind of issues i think it does but i i agree with um john michael gray says that people should only do drugs from their, uh, their nation, you know, where they're, 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 um, where they're brought up, you know, from their area of the world. So if you're a Europe, if you're a European, you should just sort of drink alcohol and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think the same is true of spiritual traditions. Um, and I, any Westerner who I've met, who's really like, Oh, I'm really into Buddhism. It's always this sort of tainted Buddhism. And I think that that spirituality, brushes over all that stuff because they're just different. They are actually quite different um, in a good way, in a good way. But I think when Westerners take that on, they usually bastardize it and find a way to have this, you know, this still Western, like, oh, I'm a Buddhist, but you're still within modernity. And it just turns into this strange thing. So what I would say is if, you know, 
you have a conclusion, spiritual conclusion in mind in which you're deconstructing modernity, etc. You can do that from the position of the Westerner. And I think you have to do that from the position of the Westerner because you'll bring you, instead of introducing a new language like you are with Buddhism and a new idea, you begin to deconstruct what it is you've built yourself, which I think is more, you know, that's more productive thing to do as opposed to just, right, I've got this problem. Instead of deconstructing the problem itself with the, what I've built, I'll just throw something on top of it. It's like, no, 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 you don't need that other thing. You need to work with, the, you, know, you need to, you know, why did you build up this idea that you need a mortgage or whatever it is? Why do you, you know, feel like you need the super duper mattress? What, why is it, you know, uh, societally weird to sleep on the floor, for instance? You know, where, you know and begin there. Again, our guest has been James Ellis, the very, very imaginative and uh, deep, deep thinker host of Hermetics uh, podcast. And let's pull up his uh, blog there that you're going to want to check out, Meta Nomad. So, <laughs> James, so awesome talking to you. And like I said, let's make this part one of an ongoing dialogue. Super, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again to James Ellis for joining me today on Skeptico. One question I tee up from this interview. Is philosophy swamped by science? Is there inability to dive in, deep dive, the way we've been talking about on this show for a while? Does that undermine some of their strongest positions? I don't know. James makes a strong case for the deep thinking philosopher that he is, and he's pulling together a lot of interesting pieces from a perspective that's quite unique. So maybe that's the counter punch to that. Let me know your thoughts. Of course, the place to do it is the Skeptical Forum. Come join me over there. Lots of great shows coming up. Stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care. Bye for now. <laughs>